So it is a great honor to host such a distinguished figure in the realm of architecture, such, our, such as our guest today, uh, with a rigor and critical approach um, to architecture, which made, made him as time, and some of you sent that in the questions, um, maybe controversial. Uh, he's been referred to as the founding father of the Monopatric religion and the Donald Trump of architecture, yet he's highly active in research, writing, teaching, and building. And I would like to introduce um, architect Patrick Schumacher. So thank you for joining us today. Um, so- My pleasure. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, this is a third year course of contemporary architecture, okay. but we opened um, the discussion for a few more students who like to join in. Um, so we prepared some questions all together and we'll probably give a little bit of time at the end for questions that may appear during our talk. Um, nice. So the first and most urgent question is perhaps, is our Khalid architects also in pursuit of flattening the curve? Flattening which curve? <laughs> the curve, flattening the curve. Oh, this one, yes, of course. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We are 100% um self-isolating working from home with uh, 400 people wow. wow but we have you know the offices contain all our machines mm -hmm. and they are connected up to the server so all the major software is running on the machines uh, in empty spaces and the staff is working uh, using um, remote uh, screen control basically and um, for the rest of us who are not so much in the trenches of uh, delivering uh, files and so on we, we are communicating and looking at work through um, go to meeting zoom um, skype for business etc okay thank you so um, I would like to first take you to a place that I think you're comfortable in, which is the future. Um, and you took quite a, um, an ambitious task on yourself, which I guess appeared in the early stages of your career. And um, you dedicated the past 24 years um, to develop, write, teach and plan. And I'm referring to um, the parametricism, a movement that you introduced not only as a new architecture language, but as much more. Um, yet only last year, the year I graduated from the AA, you published an article under the title Digital in the AA Files, this book, right, which right, um, right. an annual gathering of publications. And you admit to not yet see the digital comments to its full potential in architecture. And you ask, where is the art tech? If we see health tech, where is art tech? And why aren't we seeing um, new architecture? And now it's 2000, it's 2020, and there's a pandemic spreading around the world. Um, and we're here, um, home, um, digitalized, and uh, the conditions that we operate in have changed also for architecture studies. Um, and as you just mentioned, working um, on architecture and planning. Um, and do you believe that this moment is the moment where it all changed, um, where digital-based architecture flourishes and parametric replaces modernism um, and becomes the universal style of the 21st century? Um, no. <laughs> I think this is uh, potentially something which slows down uh, and the uh, expansion and proliferation of parametricism and it might also um, lead to actually to a new epochal style potentially. So I've been thinking about uh, the what, I mean styles are not uh, only driven by new uh, means of production, that's one element, but they're also driven by new societal requirements, societal dynamics, life processes, and how, it, and that means drives how they would like to be facilitated and accommodated in, this, in 3D space. So if this uh, experience of working from home 
and staying uh, locked up continues. And if we get used to that, and we also discovered that it's to some extent viable, Mm -hmm. um, and convenient. So I, if, if there's one thing I uh, don't regret that I haven't in the last few weeks been flying around the globe and all, a lot of trips into China, Saudi Arabia and elsewhere yeah. have been canceled. And to some extent, I see there's a, there's a certain relief uh, about that. And then discovering that we could actually make client presentation and, you know, and, and events uh, online, that, that's a learning curve. We knew that. But we, uh, uh, I think now we, if this continues, we will see a kind of ramping up of that. And that could have potentially uh, pretty striking uh, shifts in this paradigm of urbanization, which we've been seeing the last years. And that means also that parametricism and its particular values and advantages might be um, not further expanding and we need, we're looking at a shift potentially. Okay, so yeah, we, we took that as an advantage uh, and we have you here with us. I, I doubt if with all your travels, you would have the time to kind of uh, share with us this hour. Um, so following that, um, I would like to, um, I want to address- Maybe I should expand to the a little bit about this idea. So parametrism for me has a lot to do with uh, urban concentration, uh, with, with complex integration layering um, of multiple um, functions and the diversity of functions into compact space. And um, if this, uh, and modernism was more the era of spreading out, of separating out elements and suburbanization. So if this change of technology allows on the spatial side of things, more suburbanization, we don't, we don't need so much at any way. Uh, this urban concentration, which parametrism is, shows its most advantages. Um, but on the other hand, also, uh, we should also remember though, that if this continues, we'll see a lot of development in the space of um, digital communication design. So my, Theory of architecture talks about architecture, urban design, interior design, furniture design, fashion design, graphic design, web design, and interaction design, all being the design disciplines. And if there is more work of communicative framing, and all of these disciplines are involved in the uh, task of framing communicative interactions. So wherever we meet and interact, we will we'll be framed by a designer, whether it's an urban space, a garden, a park, a building, an interior, we also dressed up for the occasion. We, we have various products and objects through which we uh, um, interact and, and gather. And, and, but also, you know, these systems like we're using right now, the interfaces and, um, and who these spatialization and uh, let's say um, using graphic design, there's also communication, communicating frames of interactions and setting up models of it. Uh, interaction and that's colleagues as well so i consider this to be part of our discipline also so we might do more work in this domain and that has um a series of interesting challenges and parametrism has it, of course also something to say about this domain we used to think of this being and becoming cyberspace it was more of a kind of flat uh, graphic space so far but it might become more of a cyberspace through vr environments etc Yes, I think we architects should definitely think about the day after we leave our homes, um, since also we don't know how long it's going to take. But um, I, I wouldn't want to imagine this interface with with the other being all voice communicating, um, making the machines work without pressing buttons and without communicating with the other that you just talk to your environment and it and that's your communication. Um, we need to find yes. a way to both keep society safe, but without maybe the anxiety around it, um, to lower the anxiety. I think that's... Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I was not even talking about, I think that the anxiety will um, disappear. I think this, this will blow over. Uh, I, don't, I would more think about the attraction and the discovery of the conveniences 
and feasibility of electronic communication. I mean, I mean, we had been going, this was going over the years and so far whenever we had uh, before um, video conferences, only recently they've become a bit more viable. Before it was always incredibly painful uh, uh, to set them up and people waiting and not hearing and the connection was breaking down and it was a very frustrating and non-competitive um, let's say mechanism. Yes, I think if this, if I'm just speculating that there is a kind of shift in, in investment and also uh, improvement in these means that could have an impact on urbanization. You know, the, our houses will accumulate more functions mm -hmm. and uh, office spaces will be receding, etc. So I think, of course, there will still be so, so, space of socialization in the physical world. But I think in terms of uh, working conditions, there might be a, a shift which could have a real impact. Um, and it's the first one I see in the last 20 years, uh, something on the horizon which could push architecture into a new paradigm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll see. Um, so um, I want to address the statements that you shared in the WAF, the World Architecture. Uh, okay. festival in Berlin in 2016 and I know that kind of uh, made a big fuss and I want to give you the chance to explain yourself. Um, sure. it, it created a highly charged quite aggressive debate and I quote from um, your eight demands more like I, I see it as a manifesto almost of a city that you presented in, um, in the festival and you write um, abolish all forms of social and affordable housing, abolish all forms of rent control, and one fits all regulation of tenancies, privatize all streets, core, um, core squares, sorry, public spaces and park, possibly whole urban districts. And I don't want to hold the attempt to defend or legitimize um, these statements in any way, yet acknowledging your ex extensive publications, some deal with theoretical ideas um, of social functionalism, come to mind that addressing such taboo topics that you addressed in that festival, um, intoxicated with the effort of being controversial sometimes um, mm. and provocative, um, one tends to think that perhaps these statements fall more into an intellectual and critical conceptual exercise rather than a practical operation suggestion um, for a ramp capitalism no it's very much uh, it's very practically conceived um <laughs> not about trying to be provocative that shouldn't be provocative i mean we should be able to discuss uh you know calmly and uh, without uh, vilification and this description of bad motives and so on and uh, these kind of issues there's a lot of confusion and a lot of misinformation and uh, in this whole realm and about the causes and potential remedies of the so-called affordability and housing crisis and uh, so i've been writing about it there's a number of articles on this particular topic and um, I think we shouldn't, we should avoid letting emotions kind of fly high and, and as I said, um, uh, get ad hominem around such topics. These are just suggestions in the end. I mean, that's how I, I had to emphasize when I came back um, after being beaten up on this, first of all, to start from basic principles. I mean, the, the basis of any public communication is also in this forum and elsewhere that, uh, what public debate is about to tease out and explain and offer arguments to define which kind of rules of social interaction would lead uh, to the flourishing of everybody's freedom and prosperity and happiness. I mean, it's a common wheel, let's say. And that, uh, that that's what I'm into. So when I'm making these statements, what I'm caring about is really um, uh, the, let's say I'm sharing the same aims of those who uh, let's who kind of think that my propositions are beyond the pale and are vicious and vile. We sharing we have to respect that we're trying to understand um, uh, what would lead to everybody's 
best chances to flourish and the overall prosperity of society and everybody's well-being within that. And that's where I'm coming from. And, and so it is so highly practical because we're experiencing this housing problem you know in our own um, lives and the lives of friends of of staff in particular of students of everybody who uh, uh, who is trying to um, uh, flock to the urban centers where there is act action where there is career development productivity and interesting jobs we need this kind of we call, try to co-locate an integrated uh, labor research and cultural markets as it were and in places uh, uh, and and that is made difficult uh, by um, political barriers to this flourishing and uh, these political barriers need to be you know listed and, and exposed and they are kind of hiding behind a lot of rhetoric and false assumptions and, uh, and there's a lot of falsity <laughs> so so that has to be uncovered first before in, and then and, and so the, the propositions I'm making uh, um, I still stand by them there's they, I think they're very sensible and they would in fact benefit the overall societal development and that includes everybody's long-term interest so that's the premise uh, and I hope that subjectively at least it is granted that that's what i'm actually care about and uh, nothing else and it's the that's i think everybody who's entering a public debate uh, should uh, be granted that um let's say presumption of 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 good motives and wanting to contribute to this debate of course there might be some actors who have uh, who are biased by their own personal interests and some even uh, trying to deceptively uh, protect their interests. I mean, that can't be excluded, but I, I think that would be something one, one can, we would have to detect uh, rather than presume just because somebody comes out with a particular position that this is therefore very self-serving and divisive deliberately and, and disrespecting of uh, people's aspirations and, and, and um, uh, let's say life opportunities, not at all. So that's, for instance, I think that in terms of, um, let's say the privatization of streets, districts, public spaces. Um, first of all, I mean, there's a number of things I can say. I mean, I believe simply that this would, that allowing for that would much enrich public uh, interaction, have a diversity of, of spaces and have much more activation and utilization of these uh, spatial resources for this new urbanity and urban life, which we all seek. And uh, so that, that the, 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 the municipalities and the public um, uh, stewardships is, is lame and, and flattening and makes everything equally, let's say, um, uh, boring and, and innate. And is in fact, in the end, uh, a, a big shame, a, a kind of waste of these resources, largely. So they could do much more. And, and I think we could just compare it, for instance, to um, the world of another you know, kind of spaces of public interaction, the media, and you know, uh, whether it's uh, the, all the opportunities and channels in YouTube, or it's, 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 it's the press and mark, book market, et cetera, and compare that to, um, let's say, a state-managed media uh, world. Uh, which uh, you could find in let's say something like the GDR in the in, uh, all the way into the into the mid and late 80s, or you had you know you had you know nationalized press and nationalized TV media and radio etc. So that was very very sterile and 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 um, and uh, nobody was wishes would wish to go back to such a such a position, mm -hmm. and so that would be the kind of analogy you would draw. Uh, and that would be, um, it's usually discussed, uh, in, and of course these places would be highly public, even if they're kind of um, uh, privately owned, managed, and the, in these owners could also be charities and, 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 and cooperatives and many other things. Um, and it could also be for obviously for profit providers who, who through the profit motive would be I mean, continuously incentivized in a competitive world to, to generate 
great value for money for all ranges of uh, kind of much more differentiated audience. The problem is also with public spaces, they have to deliver a kind of ever same and even, um, let's say, average kind of condition which which fits usually the so-called mean or marginal the marginal voter the voter which sits in the center of society and decides between for instance labor and conservative and this is the uh, the kind of slice of society which all political action is geared towards and i think that is highly um non-inclusive so i'm talking about privatization in the name of inclusivity of a much more um, in deep and intense form than you could ever expect from um, kind of majoritarian, majoritarian dictate through a political process. So um, here's the argument. Let's see if anybody comes back at that or is anybody understanding that? Uh, is that, does it have viability? Someone wants to say anything. Yeah, I'm great. I'm not saying anything before I get any pushback on this one. Well, um, I could give them my capitalist. There's somebody. Huh? Well, basically, you're a capitalist. Yeah, I, I, I love capitalism. And uh, I think Israel is a fantastic beacon of capitalism. And I very admire and envy um, the productive power and creative entrepreneurship you see in Israel. Israel has, as you know, is this, you know, uh, in terms of Nasdaq presence and in, <laughs> of, of high technology firms, with the, I don't know how many people you live in Israel, maybe seven or eight million, you have more than the whole of the uh, EU, which 450 million of the most advanced, you know, so supposedly countries. Israel generates more uh, innovative uh, companies than the whole of Europe. And Congratulations, and that for me is, is, is linked. I mean, that's capitalism, and because in Europe, capitalism is um, it hardly exists anymore. It's been kind of totally stifled and chalked off. Well, I want yeah, to. I, I love capitalism. I think capitalism is a big prosperity and, uh, engine of, of, of the world economies, uh, as well as a great uh, context for individual flourishing and individualism. Um, so since you mentioned Israel and our <laughs> great innovative uh, skills, um, I, I thought about the idea of privatization um, in our sphere in Israel. And I'd like to bring you in to, to our um, contemporary surrounding. Um, so I think in 1992, just after the Gulf War, um, the state of Israel demanded that all new projects would be built with a shelter. So houses got another room, a, a room shelter, nine meters, and public spaces as well, um, sometimes in, for the whole floor, sometimes for the whole building. Um, and um, so... I don't like mandates like this. Okay, so yes, because this falls, I, I was imagining this, because this no falls in, into this very narrowing down regulation that yeah. take away the innovative. Yeah. Um, and, a, and it was also privatized because the country understood that it couldn't take this task over itself, uh, not financially and not because the size of it. And what it ended up being is exactly the opposite of innovative. We saw this. Um, mere image of repetitive um, structures and forms. But also, it's an enormous described. waste of resources. I mean, if you, this should be left to the individual or the individual tenant, if they want to move into a house or have such a shelter or don't want to have such a shelter. And uh, I don't know. I, I don't like any such impositions. And we have in Europe, we have uh, basically everything which is built is 100% prescribed. There's no entrepreneurship in the urban domain uh, left in places like uh, London or the UK or the rest of Europe. Uh, basically, they prescribe ev for every plot what are the various programs which are allowed to be built. They prescribe the overall quantum of each of those programs. 
And when it comes to residential, they prescribe the exact unit mix, that meaning how many three bedroom, four bedroom, two bedroom, one bedroom. Then they prescribe for each room the minimum sizes, the, all the facilities which have to be in there. And since uh, we're living in a world where all these things are oversized, minimum sizes are exactly prescriptive, the sizes which will be built. So there's nothing left, uh, distances between, between houses, lights, the size of balconies, the number of balconies, uh, you know, the way the washing machine and the facilities. I mean, it's, it is grotesque, the level of prescriptiveness um, uh, in this market here. It's, 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 you know, in Europe, as you know, there's also they're, 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 they're the prescribing the degree of curvature of a gherkin uh, that you can bring to market. So, so that's uh, kind of, nearly a planned economy and what what the, uh, and so i reject all of this because all of this is immensely cost costly and also uh, uh, makes sure that whatever is produced is either is, is too expensive is uh, uh, and is produced not for a market for real demand and therefore forces everybody who is trying to work, work hard to uh, to live in a place like this that they're wasting a large part of their income on things they didn't want. Could we and go the same to Eleanor? Yeah. Well. So these bunkers, I mean, uh, uh, I don't like this idea of imp imposing anything. So could we go to a London-based uh, um, um, kind of uh, structure? For instance, in London, I give you that idea. So, so first of all, there's this, the, the rhetoric is kind of grotesque. So this, this, these, all these standards are meant to uh, protect um the population the potential renters from uh being inverted commas forced to live in um substandard conditions which are supposedly uh, inhuman etc now problem is that with, with all these prescriptions these houses and places are so expensive that the most they become incredibly unaffordable and also there is restrictions quantity restrictions and delays in planning that not enough is produced so the the, the reality is of is that in fact um people are left with the choice only to kind of squeeze into flat shares it's all pushed underground if you like uh, into existing uh, um, places which are much smaller which were also for instance built in the 60s where these standards weren't weren't there of course these places are not torn down so, so the, these restrictions also prevent something which started to develop, develop in the market through, uh, uh, let's say, a, a gap in the regulations, so-called co-living, with free co-working, with small units, with a lot of additional facilities. And there are 10 or more big or medium-sized projects in London just blocked in the planning system because these projects are disliked by the planners and uh, uh, just don't meet regulations at the same time uh, those that the single project which came through is, is is rather popular and well desired and therefore can be sold overpriced so we have a lot of these distortions uh, coming through the political system and and the, basically the, uh, the the politicians which decide these um rules are not the ones who are suffering the consequences that's why they're getting away with that. And they're covered up with rhetoric <laughs> and voices which criticizes are vilified. Well, I want to come up with an example that is not the politicians, okay. but the, the public itself. And I'm referring okay. to um, the Garden Bridge designed by Thomas Heatherwick. Um, so this was an example of a privately owned public space that one can argue if matches the expectations of being innovative or whatever we spoke about or an ambitious project. Um, yet it stood against some major opposition and eventually was scrapped. Um, I think a big factor was the cost of it and even a bigger factor um, was the implication that came with the bridge being privately owned, which is in practice, the opening hours, the fees for entry, etc. Um, this this threatened the democracy, as I see it, of the public spaces, um, creating inaccessibility for some, or even excluding a whole socioeconomic um, layer from the city um, and sharing these well, spaces. I think this is, with uh, us. This is something uh, you're claiming there that there would be 
exclusions of so socioeconomic layers. I don't know if that's correct. I don't. I wouldn't expect that. Uh, now the bridge doesn't exist, so everybody's excluded. Uh, but I don't think it would have been exclusive. Um, uh, you know, uh, most this is usually not a kind of uh, successful business model. Uh, so I wouldn't have expected that. I mean, by the way, there's plenty of. I made a study of all the uh, many, many uh, publicly, uh, sorry, privately run, owned, managed, and invested uh, public spaces and squares in London. And none of them has been taken away from uh, currently existing or prior existing public space because that's obviously not allowed, although I think it should be allowed. And they created new, freshly, um, from uh, industrial wastelands, the so-called you know brownfield sites, which these uh, uh, projects have been built upon. So, so there are plenty of them. This is uh, of the whole of King's Cross, uh, uh, you know, uh, Paternoster Square in the City of London, Canary Wharf, the new uh, developments at, at Paddington, and many smaller ones. So they're generating new. Uh, public spaces and they're very well accepted. It's not even noticed by the public, whether they are private or public. They are uh, well managed. And what I find interesting, I did a study on walkable London and pedestrianization and they're actually uh, having a great emphasis on uh, pedestrian urban districts. And I find that progressive and I find it useful and there's no sense of exclusiveness there's no controls no nobody's charging anything for any of these places uh, even though i wouldn't exclude that you sometimes uh, have uh, if you wanted to have very particular kinds of events and very particular kinds of audience you make you could also put a price on and have certain restrictions i wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, exclude this i mean you have that you find so-called in, in the various private clubs or nightclubs, you go to a nightclub, you have uh, bouncers <laughs> and, um, um, and, and entrance fees. Uh, so so, so to, because sometimes you want a particular experience and that, that is, there are certain filters uh, which make that happen. But that's not going to be, that's going to be 1% out of 100% of, of spaces where, where such mechanisms would, would come to bear and the monetization could in many ways it could be in the real estate increase you get it through the rents of the shops and bars and clubs uh, and houses which are sitting on these private spaces it could also be advertising um, like most of the public media spaces uh, uh, could be indirectly financed in many ways you could also have of course um, um, some kind of subscription and membership and so uh, uh, conditions in certain parks i mean now in, in london for instance is there's, there's a lot of these garden squares, for instance, Bedford Square right in front of the AA, no one's demonstrating and tearing down these fences. Uh, I think- the, But Patrick, you have to admit that it's quite sad that such a miraculous garden is locked. I think so, I think so, and there's it's lots locked. of them. There is, you know, we use it obviously at the AA for, for, for special events. Every uh, institution on the, on the garden has, has a, uh, around the Bedford Square has a key to this, so there's also a, a kind of a, the London School of the Humanities could use it for their uh, commencement ceremonies. But I agree with you, it's a little underutilized, and that's a problem in terms of a transaction cost. That this is this is a kind of traditional way these things were set up, and and um, they sh maybe this garden should be uh, sold to somebody who's then renting it back to the AA uh, once a year. Uh, you would have more utilization and you find it all over London, particularly in Kensington, you have all these houses uh, with keys to the to that kind of enclosed garden. I mean, I don't know if your solution makes it worse, Patrick. I don't know. I mean, anyway, we have that. I, I agree that this is not a great example, um, but I think it could be managed much more. This is more some kind of, it's not, um, 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 uh, there's no initiative taken on these. I agree with that. And I, I think even now more than ever, when we're confirmed with our little private sphere, we're in, in need of our immediate public spaces, like you referred to Bedford Square, that it operates around it. And um, I think these spaces, if were privately owned, um, would most likely to be shut now. Um, 
that's what I don't believe. As I said, uh, there's so many of these new uh, public spaces. They have no fences. They have no uh, controls. They have they're 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 they're, they're open because that makes more sense for, for generating the, the, the benefits, uh, which then flow back to the owners in one way or another. So, so I wouldn't expect that. Um, uh, what I expect, as I said, is, is more utilization, more activity, more investment, more, more diversity of addressing various audiences. Look, we, we don't know. At the moment, we're just scared of this. And there is kind of prejudice that this would lead to uh, closures and disutilization and the they become the preserve of a few rich who never use them. <laughs> I mean, that wouldn't make economic sense. I don't believe that. So that's just the presumption you have. I have a different hypothesis, but we can never test this out because we have, uh, let's say uh, we're too scared or we have a political um, um, arguments dominating that, that stand against that. So, so that's why we'll never know. I, my, my argument is let, you know, why can't that be opened up? And uh, to be what and let the discovery process, the market as discovery process, find the best utilization. Uh, I think the, the the profit and loss system would would guide this to maximum utilization. Um, you don't open a bar or a restaurant in order to have it uh, standing empty and underutilized. And the same would 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 would, would I think would probably apply to a park. That doesn't mean that there's also a market for more reclusive usages. I mean, there's enough space for many things to occur. Um, and we discussed, for instance, Bedford Square, which is more of an accident, but in Kensington, you have you have houses. Uh, and in the summer, you have the, the, the owners, uh, because they don't have a back garden, uh, they they cross the street into the into the garden square and, 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 and sit there and have their picnic. And that's reserved to owners. I mean, I wouldn't say this is these kind of Things have to be excluded, but they are they only happen with smaller places, and they're not. Uh, they would be. They would. That would be a minority. Um, okay, I want to read you one okay. fantastic question that the student sent. Yeah. Um, so, following the 2018 startup cities discussion with your um, participation, there the student has two questions. First, can you resist any other? architect's project in the 30 feet away from your studio or home window and the second question is there any project that you would refuse to plan and for what fees would you agree to plan them anyway <laughs> well um first of all i don't know what the first question replies or replies to i mean i i what i find a shame is that in current the spirit of the way cities agglomerate is by architects uh, um, don't feel i don't want planners to put everybody uh, into position to to be similar according a kind of master plan let's say how you generate some kind of synergy and harmony between different buildings i would hope that the discipline would that we would kind of take each other to task and criticize and have critics and mutual criticism within architecture bring everybody up to uh, more for sophisticated standards which would also mean that there would be an ethos of contextual embedding of affiliation to surrounding projects the, the client brings the project into an area also particularly because he's looking for co-location synergy so his building is placed here because he wants the tenants uh, who will sit there and the institutions will have something to do with and have connections and functional synergies with what goes on in the building so surrounding. So I would want this to lead to resonances and affiliations and something more integral so that the architect doesn't come with a preconceived idea uh, and generate some kind of alien icon. And in the end, you have an agglomeration of icons which don't speak with each other, which all scream in their own kind of, um, um, let's say, uninflected individual um, um, message i don't like this kind of urbanism i don't think that a state intervention can help this this is something where the discipline has to where we have to take each other to task where we have to be more critical of each other where i don't respect this for instance of course in terms of power everybody an architect and client 
coming to a site, they should have the freedom to do what they wish, but they sh we should also have a public discourse. So I believe in market plus discourse. I'm actually working on a book, Markets and Discourses. So I think that we have sort of politics coming in and, and, and uh, forcing a kind of majority will, which is also very tenuous and is more the imagination of the politician that he represents majority. What we should have is a culture of market freedom and discursive critique, which would, which would um, put pressure and, and, and make everybody uh, uh, get the best of everybody for the sake of, of the kind of collective uh, creations which come out of the, through the city. So it's now it's very kind of egotistically within the frame of a totalitarian prescription and uh, th that delivers the worst of results. So, so I believe in, in, in a discourse where we criticize each other um, and, and um, I think we would respond to that also and the, and the market also interfaces with discourses. So that's what I believe. In terms of who I would work for, I don't know, I mean uh, I have usually we have a lot of uh, uh, selection opportunity, right? So we are not desperate to, to, to get, uh, you know, a work and we will have to kind of cringe to just to survive, do something which we don't believe in. No. So we have a lot of choice. And um, what I love to do usually is we, 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 we can select clients who obviously value what we're bringing to the, to the project. We like, in fact, um, public project. It's not because they're government run. This is the, not necessarily the best aspect of it, but that they are cultural projects with a lot of audiences and a lot of interesting um, um, e events which concern, uh, you know, uh, communities and global audiences. So these are projects we, we often like to participate. And we also like to work, of course, for, for mixed use projects in inner cities and uh, commercial projects. We also don't mind to do luxury uh, in the mix. I believe that there is, you know, uh, uh, for instance, for uh, that that uh, that people who are delivering a lot of value for for the world. Um, um, for instance, when you when you generate a new fantastic app which makes everybody's life more productive, and you and you you can make billions of lives better and and more value yet some of that and only a small fraction of it flows back to the creators of that, then they should also be able to, to enjoy that and, and get a nice place which inspires them and in, in, in the very center of the networks in which they, they, they exist and also places where they can throw a party, uh, where they may create network events and so on. So we did projects like this, which are more on the high end of, of costs like for instance in New York. So we don't mind that, uh, but we also do, uh, we'd like to do in, in, you know, co-living projects for, which are very, very economical. So, so uh, I have no um, 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 a preference, uh, let's say, or if I don't have to think about do I do this or do that. We, we actually love to work, do work in urban centers mostly. Um, that's more interesting to us than doing, let's say, individual villas or resorts where where the um, advantages of parameters and where architecture doesn't have to work that hard. I like to work on projects where it's, it's quite intricate and difficult to generate an uplifting and, and well-functioning space where also the functionality is highly, let's say, demanding and sophisticated. That's, that's the kind of challenge we like, like an inner city, large uh, urban uh, mixed-use complexes is something which you kind of, and, a very high density, also larger structures where we can try out our ideas of atrium and 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 uh, deep vistas and intervisibility, into awareness within certain spaces. The kind of projects I like, and uh, I'd like to do them where um, um, anywhere around the world where, where there's a desire and demand for that. Hmm. So. Um Let's stay there. And, and since it's establishing, you have taken the role of co-founder, of co-director of the Design Research Lab, the DRL at the AA. Um, and for many years, um, Zahrid Architects uh, recruited highly skilled students that just graduated the program. Um, so I think the students would like you to address perhaps 
what is the future role of the architect or where do you see young architects going, um, both in, in your view as a professor and as a boss, perhaps? Well, I mean, it's been a great uh, pleasure and also very productive for us as a firm and me as a person to work with the A and to build that program and uh, have uh, teach, co-teach with a lot of ex-students and also with current staff who help as tutors. I mean, all the other tutors are, they're kind of, they're very inbred out of the, out of the, uh, out of the, the course and also they'll be part of a global network, of course. But what is nice about it, we, we, a lot of what we're doing in the firm now, we had research agendas across multiple years where we, worked on this and we developed the ideas, um, the concepts, uh, the techniques. And for instance, that was parametric urbanism, the kind of, uh, at the time when urbanization kind of uh, took off again and on a larger scale, we developed that idea when we looked at integrating something into working towards something which I now call tectonism, where we looked at um, structural system and uh, under environmental engineering um, um, facade systems and um, uh, new forms of, of fabrication, etc. So we pioneered that with the uh, uh, AADRL. And then we developed that our skeleton towers later on in the office, or we when we looked at um, uh, tensile and uh, shell structures, something very interesting. So we developed parametrism away from just playing with nerve surface and forms, and had other constraints, engineering constraints in terms of structural optimization. And what I love about it is not only are these more efficient and we can squeeze out some of the uh, Porsche space and make them give more space for social interaction, but we're also getting more characterful morphologies which, and more different morphologies and geometries so we can make a richer and more, let's say, articulate built environment. So, so these um, ideas were developed with the students. So you can imagine that for so I'm discussing it now from the perspective of the business. Uh, a business like ours, where in a, in a commercial context, it's very difficult when you're confronted with a commission or with the, with the competition mm -hmm. to develop uh, something fresh and quite different from what you've been doing within a space of that we usually get is about six weeks, eight weeks. And that's too risky and that's unmanageable. So then you would, you would rely on tested solutions and that's what you find in other similar firms who don't have that pipeline of research and you find that in somebody maybe like Frank Gehry, you find that maybe you know the firm as Foster or Rogers, they're very stable in their product over decades and what we have done, we have, we have allowed us this research branch which is um, the AA, but it also was for 15 years the Angewandt in Vienna, as well as some other studios in Yale, Harvard, and Columbia, etc. So that's very, very important. And for the students, what is satisfying is that they can work on cutting-edge innovative research, but with the, with, with the horizon of tangibility and practical applicability. And the initial steps into uh, reality maybe through a smaller project, through an installation, through a pavilion, mm -hmm. was quite early on the horizon or what we, had, we did at the A, we had already uh, sometimes competitions running in parallel. So and then when the students come into the office, they, they can continue what they've been doing, but also when they're as students, they realize what they're working on uh, is not something which, which is 30 years away from realization or is, is highly theoretical <laughs> and, and, and that would be, but there's some sort of disciplining tangibility which focuses the mind. And there's also which what I bring into the, into the studio. So I think that symbiosis is very important, but I'm highly conscious of the fact that Zarid Architects, we couldn't do what we're doing without that. It's very difficult to do that. I mean, now as we are larger, we have actually a number of research groups within the company but that is not quantitatively still less so than the um, school. So this combination school of architecture and a, and, a, and a firm or firms is fantastic. And as, unfortunately, there's not enough of that. For instance, Rogers, Foster, all these guys that don't do much teaching um, and many others don't. Thomas Heserwick doesn't. On the other hand, the, 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 school of, the school is full of 
um, very small, uh, let's say, uh, teachers, young teachers who have very little studios and they, they do big projects maybe and ambitious things, uh, speculative things in the school and then they, in their own work, they do either nothing or they do a, a kind of uh, apartment conversion or something. And they can't also offer much jobs to the students. So, so it's a shame that there is what, what, what the situation which, which I'm advertising here uh, ha hasn't happened uh, more often. And it's something which, uh, of course, uh, uh, and this can continue. I mean, this, is, uh, uh, this also helped us to grow, of course. It feels like you're recruiting my students as well. <laughs> <laughs> Look, absolutely. We, uh, <laughs> I mean, I wish we could grow more than we than we can't be growing, but we are we are um, uh, always looking out to expand. So in the last year, we actually expanded by um, our turnover by thirty percent and our people e equally. So we had we had we had five, uh, we had over fifty new people. Okay. Um, I want to ask another student's question. Oh, please, and then yeah, we'll, let's let's have interaction. We'll open it to the. To the public. So um, they said that you are um, okay. In this uh, ongoing crisis, we lost several important architects, uh, Vittorio Girotti and Michael Sorkin, and so on. And if you would like to commemorate them by telling some stories about them or share an insight about what we may learn from them, we would have appreciated very much. <laughs> That's a tough one. I mean, I know, of course, Michael Sorkin was a friend, and we had. We had lots of interactions more at the time when we were more, um, you know, based in New York when we were teaching at Columbia. He was also mm -hmm. there and when he showed up at Yale and so on. And he did some interesting work. He was a, he was an urbanist as much as an architect, and he did quite a, quite quite speculative theoretical studios. Um, so so I, I like him. He was a, he was a fan of Zaha's early works and he was a promoter. So so it's a, it's it's a great loss. He was a very smart, and sophisticated character. Uh, not so much uh, in contact in recent years, but uh, over the over many years in contact. And I mean, yeah, it's a shame. Gregotti, Gregotti was. Um, I'm not sure how progressive a force he was in in the last um, um, decades in Italy. I mean, I remember very well that. So you know, it's quite interesting in in these national um, scenes of architects. Uh, sometimes you have these waves of uh, important architects and in, in, in Italy, it was uh, connected up with this uh, neo-rationalism slash postmodernism, which Gregotti was a part of together with Rossi and, 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 and uh, many others. And in that, uh, they, were, they were quite dominant, they were important and uh, in through through the you know late sixties and seventies uh, and eighties, but they they then kind of became over dominant and maybe uh, blocked the next generation a little bit, and maybe Gilgotti was was part of that. So sometimes you have these very strong generations, and then uh, career is too long, longer than the kind of waves of innovation. <laughs> so if they don't Trans self transform and and move on and self develop, uh, then you we have a problem. So so I don't want to say something negative or that I'm already doing it for Gregotti, but that's what I remember the Gregotti. I mean I haven't seen him in recent years, but when we are uh, we were when we won Maxi uh, for mm -hmm. us a great breakthrough, and I think it was a it's a very stimulating effort for for you know Italy and Rome. This was particular in recent decades have been conservative or dominated also by postmodernism, the whole of the Italian scene, uh, he wasn't very, uh, let's say, pleased. <laughs> and it was a difficult um, challenge to, uh, and he was still a quite, quite important figure at the time. So that's also what you have. I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I love great, I mean, the, sometimes you have these, these, these um, great figures who keep reinventing themselves and I mean, are fantastic into the, the, the latest years. I mean, I, I would say that this was, of course, the case with Le Corbusier. People, uh, the great heroes, they remain very, very open and, 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 and full of new ideas in their late works. I'm not sure if that's true for Gorgotti. Daniel, would you like to ask your question? Okay, I can ask it for him. Um, or let's see, uh, Leoa, is she here? 
You're here. Do you want to ask it? You're I mute. Can't see you. uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, you shared with us a lot about your social economic philosophy, and I think you started hinting at it before um, when you were talking about um, the opportunity for diversity in architectural form. But I would like to hear you expound a bit more on. Um, the connection between your social economic philosophy and the quest for form and complex geometry as represented by parametricism in your office. Thank you. That's a very important and interesting question. So um, I think these things are connected and the way they're connected is that um, the socioeconomic philosophy I'm um, adhering to is historically the primary driver for what then architecture should adapt to so there is um, because when it comes to um, socioeconomic life processes and economic processes and, and work and live processes we need to really be aware that what we're all after and that's the kind of human universal and also across historical eras is productivity gains. Um, what we really after is and that because that's material freedom. That's making life lovely and pleasant and, and we could be frolicking in the Garden of Eden <laughs> nearly if we have these productivity gains. That means for instance that a large part of our, like all of you guys, you don't have to, uh, even in, when in your mid twenties, I don't know how old you are, you not have to yet fully as, you, as students be integrated into the production process. You have the freedom to discover who you are, what you want to do and so on. This, this is a great freedom or you could also retire at a certain point or we have weekends and holidays and lots of freedom and also work itself becomes lots of a drudgery and more self-directed and nearly becomes a kind of pleasure, a creative pleasure. So that is, that is only possible when we have these productivity gains, right? So, so when you had a, an era where you a kind of a um, back-breaking and eye-consuming scribe uh, copying a, a, a manuscript over and you generate after so many, many hours one more potential reader, uh, that is not very productive. In the printing press, you can print millions in split seconds, but now, we have uh, you download these elements so the productivity gain is maybe about in the order of uh, i don't know one billion and it's nearly uncountable right? so so these are the kind of things which and then that that requires um, um science technology but also the investment uh, flows and market processes to 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 this to bring to bring up these productivity uh, gains and spread them around. So, so that's what we need to, we never get enough of that. Um, and, and so we need to focus on this. So if you have uh, the choice between a, a, a social economic system, which delivers, let's say stability, um, zero growth, which we had in Europe for the last 10, 15 years, uh, zero productivity growth, so per capita income, not that it is, and plus when you have kind of false redistribution on top, you actually for a large part of the pack, you have lowering uh, 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 real incomes. And whole of Japan had a negative real income for 30 years. And of course the Japanese, they put up with this, they're working hard and they're working ever harder. And that's not what's pleasant, that's not nice. So we should, uh, and um, so, so that should be taken for granted. And sometimes it's not so perceptible. If you have 3% growth versus zero, or let's say 0 0.3 growth, within 15 years, you could double everything, including your free time. So that's something we should never be uh, blase about. And I find it tragic that in the last 10, 15 years, there was not enough of that in the advanced countries. Of course, China and other catch up growth is much easier. So they have been kind of, had monumental increases in, in, in their life capacities. I mean, the, the drudgery, the, you know, the, the parents' generation has, and the degrees of freedom of flourishing and, and zooming around the globe and picking elite universities and 
of, of a large part of the Chinese population. That's what we should wish and want for everybody. So that's, and that's possible, I believe, and we have the AI revolution and, and digitalization uh, happening, but we're not utilizing it because we have socioeconomically wrong, um, uh, let's say, frameworks. But still, some of it is happening, and I call it post forest network society, right? So it's a very, very different and potentially exhilarating paradigm, which makes life so much more fun and beautiful for everybody. And mm -hmm. that, is, uh, that means that we need the grease of freedom. That's what I understood. Rather than being locked in a big kind of um, uh, bureaucratic, huge corporation in a suburban field in an assembly line, beavering away uh, for, for, for 30 years and doing a new version of Cornflex or another washing machine version, etc. Let's say the Fordist paradigm. Uh, that's, uh, you, you do have flowing water and you do have a packaged holiday, but it's still drudgery. And now we can have, uh, uh, we can actually have, re this work is done by robots and they could be reprogrammed on a daily basis. And also a lot of software services. You can upload a new software app every minute if you like. So we can have ideas and inventions and innovations and creative ideas. They can be absorbed by these technologies. They couldn't be absorbed by these technologies in the 50s and 60s. There was no scope, no space for innovation. That's why you could sit on in the suburb and beaver away. Now we have to come together in the city centers for research, development, marketing, financing, new ideas, startup culture. And that is what delivers you know, this, a much better life, but also enormous productivity gains. And uh, that's what we should allow to flourish. And this is this urban concentration which nobody can plan anymore. So we need degrees of freedom for any actor to self-locate into these networks, right? You need to have the freedom to work where you want to work. You need to be, as an employer, as an entrepreneur, free to hire who you like and place your firm where you like and, and, and make it large or small or medium, how you wish it and what you want to be next to. So you need this discovery process for everybody so they can find each other and utilize the, the, the scarce urban space and that means also, in terms of parametrism now, that fits into this because parametrism is very open to weave these networks, to let these pieces come together in complex layered assemblies and to make them legible through making one element adapt and affiliate to another, uh, embrace another, uh, um, uh, register impacts and trajectories and connections and weave that thing. That's what parametrism is great about. And if you use parametric tools and you have, you have um, let's say, rule-based morphologies evolving, where all the different parameters and factors and interaction requirements, in a sense, embed themselves and express themselves, then they function well and they also be legible and they become transparent. And that's empowering for the users as well. So I think very, very close match between parametricism and what I call post forest network society. And th that is just compelling in terms of its productivity advantages, but also in terms of it's the fun of being part of it, right? So it's much more uh, beautiful and easy to live now than live in the 70s. I mean, you, you, the, the, not only how much we are, even though you complain about you in certain dimensions, you're much more rich. You can participate and communicate around the world. Not all of this is measured in GDP these advances and that you can kind of snap up a, 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 you have the idea to go to New York tomorrow, you can now in within half an hour, you can book a flight, forget coronavirus for a moment and, 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 and be there and get a very, very cheap ride and then have an, before you, on the way in the taxi, you book the hotel and then you, you I mean, in the end, and then you participate in many things and you should also be able to step into a firm and start working. Now, so there's also there's a lot of bureaucratic barriers to that, and but the 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 gist for me is very clear. So parametrism is um, in its kind of values and what it's what it aspires to, namely legible uh, density, complexity in urban, uh, let's say fabrics. That's a very very facilitative, and uh, but also of course we are using that's where it. Be, and be utilizing also all the new uh, technological means. 
algorithms, evolutionary optimization, um, 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 complex, uh, uh, you know, let's say structural optimization morphologies, which make the building much lighter, more robust, uh, make the ecological footprint less in terms of differentiating the facade elements, etc. So we also have we have cost effectiveness, uh, but but also we have incredible benefit advantages. And uh, other styles who can't really do that. I mean, a minimalist can't make use of topology optimization. He's already has a lot of a priori's that he's just going to use kind of massive walls or sheer walls or, or undifferentiated grids. So there's a lot of, let's say, loss of um, two things, um, um, economic rationality, but also lack of legibility. So, so the minimalist can't express the complexities of its internal uh, operations and intricacy. So, so you can see what, um, and I, I finish with that, you see there's a kind of congeniality between parametricism and post photos network society, and there is the superiority of post photos network society. And therefore, it becomes more compelling, and that's why this is the direction for the discipline of architecture globally to develop into. And I would say, as I said earlier, we need markets and discourses. So we are doing flourishing in the market, and we get a lot of jobs and a lot of people wanting to work for us, but also, we are flourishing in the discourse and uh, I love discussing with you guys, but it's also, of course, we need to succeed. So, so, so I challenge uh, everybody here to, to um, counter this or, or defend maybe um, neo-historicism or neo-postmodernism or um, minimalism as a form of neo-modernism uh, as something which has viability and, and, and um, has lacks into the future, I don't believe that. So, so that's a challenge back to you. I don't know what what um, direction of architecture you would defend, and uh, why. And if you don't have a position, then um, um, uh, I suspect that you will take up mine, or you remain agnostic. Let me let me have it. Um, so on that on that note, one last question, Patrick. Would no, 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 but she asked me. I mean, I was wondering what her position is. What? what okay, sorry. Yes. Like yes. And and what kind of politics she likes? Uh, no, I think there's. Um, I I definitely agree with you on free markets. Wow, that's um, great. <laughs> um, and I think it's interesting also to. Um, be living in Israel specifically because uh, of our background. It's true that you mentioned the the innovation um, in wow. in the technology sector here, but also we have a background in socialist um, uh, sure. uh, policies, especially when it comes to housing. Um, so it's interesting to see how those two meet in Israel. And uh, regarding whether or not I'm an agnostic or what's my position. Uh, I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So what's going on in Israel in terms of, um, let's say, uh, social housing and uh, rationing of urban space and subsidies of apartments, etc. Is there, is that, is that a lot of going on? Is there a lot of deep involvement of the government in, in residences? Someone wants to answer. Yeah, anybody. I mean, is or is it more? Is it moving in a different direction? I mean, for instance, the question: Do we have a lot of uh, strictures, a lot of uh, standards? Or, for instance, could you, as an entrepreneur in in Israel, um, develop a co-living project which has very small units, or would that violate the rules? No, that would uh, be impossible. Yeah. No, we are highly restricted in Israel as regards to uh, what we can and what we cannot build. It's uh, very restrictive. We're very restrictive, mostly in terms of uh, zoning. Okay. Which uh, I think would be interesting to to hear what you have to say about it. Well, I think zoning zoning is uh, zoning is a massive massive cost on the economy. Also, I think. It, it's problem. I mean, in contemporary urban life, 
you don't need zoning anymore. That made sense maybe when you had the potential of having a big polluting industrial noisy uh, uh, factory in the middle of a city with trucks coming in and out. I don't think that would anybody would ever uh, do this because there's much better ways to place large scale industry. So, so that, that danger has been out of the way for a long, long time. And I don't see any other requirement of zoning in terms of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, protecting. So, so I think zoning is, is a big problem. And the problem is oftentimes it makes, the tragedy is that, uh, that it makes uh, living in certain centers and certain productivity hubs extraordinarily expensive uh, because it's mostly restricting uh, development at all and then also restricting uh, what and where things get developed if at all. So you have uh, San Francisco and, and the Bay Area is one example and, and Manhattan and New York is another example. Uh, London is another example and it, it is, it's, it's, the tragedy is here that uh, that's where you have these co-location synergy that's where you wanted to have entrepreneurs and young workers and older workers and scientists flock to, to be part, and because they would be more productive. And now a person has to make this very, very tough decision. Either I'm joining this place uh, and I pay an arm and a leg, maybe 80% of my salary to, for the sake of career development and being part of this and my kind of Otherwise, my, my, my comfort levels are sort of compromised heavily. But also, the startup company might be tough for renting space. Uh, and so, or am I going to another place in another city, uh, whether it's Dallas or Austin or Denver, or these places also become expensive, um, um, where, where um, I have it easier but I'm not connected up, so my career will be stunted, my firm will not be flourishing the same thing. So these decisions are made, and, 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 uh, and you can imagine that it's, first of all, it's, it's, it's a tough call, but the more people make that second decision, they whole life project and life capacity remain stunted, and if that happens to more and more people, the overall um, um, productivity is, is, is reduced and that's a big factor. And there's some people are trying to put um, a cost to that. What rezoning policies cost the American economy? And the, this is very, very large amounts. And, and, but again, these costs are, are not abstract. They are basically um, uh, include, uh, you, know, you know, most of the, people's vital energies, which are wasted or stunted or remain unrewarded uh, for longer or for forever. So, so this, that's a big problem. So I'm, a big, I'm, I'm, I'm a, not a fan of zoning at all. And, and um, I think we should allow urban districts to change, to, to, to build up density. I can accept exceptional, um, let's say, historic centers to be preserved as assets. And even the private sector would do that because that would be something everybody appreciates and wants to experience so that would have economic value but to protect uh, all sorts of back you know uh, backward milieus and low density districts it makes little sense it only makes sense for you know it's also very divisive and 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 split society and those who have luckily at an earlier stage purchased a piece of land or a house and those those who move to these places from elsewhere who, who, who are the, the next generation. There's a kind of big divide and income uh, inequality which is generated by that, which I think is, which is, which is unfair. So zoning I think is highly unfair um, because it's highly uh, monopolizes and privileges uh, and protects, it's a form of protectionism against uh, competitions. Uh, and therefore means other people who also want to, want to participate in, in, in the urban flourishing. And that's a big tragedy of zoning and it's very, very expensive. I mean, um, uh, places with this kind of, um, yeah, I think zoning doesn't allow in enough people to participate in these great urban hubs. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, hi, Patrick. Um, sure. I'd love to hear 
um, your thoughts about identity in architecture, uh, especially following Zahadi's uh, passing uh, just a few years ago. I'd like to know what you think about um, how to create a specific identity or how to even continue one um, in a, such a firm. Well, I, I don't, uh, I think identity is more of a byproduct of something which is more, um, it should, you shouldn't kind of self, too much self-reflect and, and, and uh, foster and, and, and hone something which you call your identity. I think that's fallacy. <laughs> Uh, if anything, it's something which is inevitable when you when you have certain pursuits and you have cert you use certain set of tools, which are particular if you innovate somehow, you're about what's better and what's better for everybody and what could be generalizable. But because it's you and your history and your particular group of people and tools, that we were sensitive to. So a certain identity is, is comes out of it. And you might you might it's a byproduct, you might be recognizable about it. And if anything, that means a limitation. That mean, namely is that you that it wasn't fully rational what you're pursuing, but it was just what you, who you were, and you can't get out of your skin. So I'm very proud to be recognized our works that as a part of, let's say, parametrism or tectonism, uh, and that means I'm part of a movement where there's many different verses, versions, but I don't I'm, I'm feel a bit of a letdown internally and also if it's recognized as Zahadid Architects. Uh, that that just for me spells a limitation. That means, and of course, we all have these limitations. We, you 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 know, uh, you might want to invent yourself and and you, the way you kind of project yourself, and you know you wanted to be a different person, and then you kind of step out and you you the same kind of uh, uh, boring character or something. So that's not something that identity is something I, which hamp holds us back, and I find that anyway. Uh, in and that's why I'm also. Uh, uh, not only therefore, but in many ways, I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm hostile to this whole idea of identity politics and the cherishing of identities. This means cherishing um, uh, some kind of history which is you're lumbered with, you've been kind of thrust into, and I'm a kind of existentialist, so you should kind of thrust yourself out of that <laughs> and be, be future open and open to all sorts of influences which uh, which might make you uh, somebody more flourishing and productive. And I always I never see the contradiction. You know, if you have a proper functioning market economy and uh, uh, let's say guided by discourses, and I think this is still important, that uh, that you would your, your your personal flourishing is always you flourish through giving more, through um, uh, in in a, in, a, in a proper rule of law uh, system. Of course, if you you have you have you have um, um, let's say structures, very, very kind of uh, structures which are kind of mafia style pro structures which work through through oppression and violence, the threat of violence and so on. Then that isn't the equation. But let's say more or less in uh, the more in the more kind of open liberal uh, free market environments, you, your own personal flourishing and reinvention is also your person uh, is, is also. Uh, the way you gift more and more to the world and to others, um, not to, to everybody equally, but it, it in a sense, there's a chain reaction which everybody in the end benefits, um, however minutely, uh, even if you have your own particular clients, which then have their clients and they also have their kind of customers and clients, so in the end kind of radiates and ripples through. So, so that's what I would say in terms of identity. Um, um, it's a great, uh, it's, it's something you should always watch out in terms of getting rid of it. I appreciate that. Patrick, so maybe we should go back to your beginning, maybe. Um, and this, maybe this identity question, maybe should go to um, more of, so in our, I'll give you a little bit of the background. So in our advanced studio at Betzala, as the fourth and the fifth year student have the luxury of like picking their own topics and spaces to intervene in and um, locations and enhance them with such a rich variety of research tools that they can bring in and really dive in uh, theoretically and pragmatically into a subject that they care about. Um, and looking back at your portfolio, it's very evident that you kind of brought your um, interest and um, the, the studies you have, um, you have approached to before architecture 
into the realm of architecture as an as an architecture student, but also as a young architect, and you kind of overlap these um, these notions and these ideas together. And we really are in Betawa trying to to prosper these um, these values that the students bring themselves, their ideas, their identity, as Shaka referred to, into their project. And I want you to tell them maybe a little bit of how you did it or what drove you to do it so that maybe we could all be inspired by it and direct ourselves there. Okay, let me say one more thing about this identity. So I said, I put it down just now that you shouldn't something you should have honed and be proud of and be stuck with. But at the same time, it's a resource you, you have. You can reflect on it and it's difficult to get out of your skin and, and acquire vast new capacity so you also reflect on what you can do with it now that you've got it however <laughs> accidentally you acquired it so so you also need to work with what what you've got and, and and make use of it your talents your knowledge and so on and see it utilization and utilize it and out of that process you might also evolve your identity but you can never maybe leave it all together behind so you know uh, saying something else so it's it's not that you make a very fetish of it but you also um a kind of an attempt to escape on it every week is also false, right? Because you're not going to get anywhere. You need to build your career cumulatively, uh, which what you had acquired and make the best utilization of it. But if you are relatively youngster and you acquire new skills and you still have the openness, the malleability of your personality and your skill range, also discover new things is very important. And uh, so you, 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 you respect it as a limitation but you, also, you try to move further, but you also see it as a potential resource you've got and you don't have, and to acquire new resources is always an, an in-between step. So what has come to me, so, so when I came to architect, I had studied some philosophy, I was also politically very active, and initially they were kind of separate domains because when you step into architecture, there's not, initially there wasn't a place for that, right? There wasn't an audience, there wasn't an obvious utilization route. And that was for the first three years of my studies. I didn't um, use philosophy, I didn't use politics. And when I moved to London, there was a different scene, which was much more fertile suddenly, because actually architects were discussing philosophy. We were discussing Deleuze and Guattari in 87, you know, just was the translation of Thousand Plateaus came out. We were looking at uh, deconstructism was, uh, was, was, was had its high, so we were reading uh, Foucault, Derrida and all of that and at the AA as well in seminars. So suddenly my, my, um, my previous philosophy education had cachet and mean something I could, and I also brought in my political interests and I did some studies, historical studies, uh, as well as uh, projects which had politically informed and socioeconomically informed agenda. So, so that wasn't possible in the previous school, which was more of a kind of, you know, a little bit less um, advanced, a bit more stuck in an older era, technically oriented school in Stuttgart. So, so, uh, so, so that was a discovery of a kind of resource and, and parallel identity, or let's say a set of skills and interests I had, which I brought into combustion with architecture. And that I thought was quite, it was uh, exhilarating because I discovered that I had an edge somewhere. Whereas before I was a kind of a middle of the road, I had my passions with, you know, this kind of quasi high tech foster architect. I did some nice projects, but um, I was kind of um, um, maybe there were some others who did that better because they had uh, maybe um, um, some prior experience, maybe their parents were architects, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's also something you should always uh, tease out. Is there something you've got? accidentally or through some outside passions or it's just the raw talent you have and to, it gives you an edge that means you know there's competitive sense but it's also if you have an edge here that means you're doing more you're giving more you're 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 you're, you're, you're contributing more than you would have so that is a little bit um it, and, and that inevitably then becomes some kind of identity if you like and you can uh, you can um, 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 own up to this at the same time wanting to evolve it further, and it's not something which is, was inherent. So so uh, I can't trace this back deeper uh, into my family history or environment or influences. 
uh, you, you, in the end, you, uh, I started uh, as a teenager to, although I was not reading until the age of 16, I was basically into football and tennis and sports, uh, and nearly kind of 12 hours a day. And then suddenly I discovered books and reading and in, an intellectual world quite late. And uh, so, so, but I had stored up when I joined and I finally arrived in architecture. I had a lot of erudition and, 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 and reading, and I was also living a parallel world, let's say, in Trotskyist um, uh, movement as an, as an activist, and I learned a lot of there. And, and that, in the end, um, the, 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 the scene was ripe uh, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s, for this to have meaning and architecture could absorb it because architecture had, was going through this massive crisis where modernism was bankrupt and you had a new um, you had paradigm shift and all values were overboard and the, the game was up for anybody to come up with new um, routes forward. You know, there was postmodernism, neo-historicism, minimalism, deconstructivism, and then became the, this wave of uh, uh, new tools came into the discipline as well. And this was highly, uh, philosophy was, was highly on book because you can imagine in, a, in an era of fluidity and paradigm shift and where all the fundamental values, uh, certainties of a prior era were a kind of uh, blown up and you had to rediscover, pass forward. Then for, this is the kind of era where philosophy has a lot of, uh, people look towards philosophy, they ask deeper questions about, uh, you know, um, the meaning of, of form and content, uh, because that's now no longer kind of a fixed uh, line of, of, of development from, from, from uh, function to form, etc. but also in terms of um, um, models of societal transformation. I mean, this is also the breakdown of communism. So there was a lot of confusion about, um, you have Deng Xiaoping and pushing China into capitalism. You had the, 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 the before the, 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 all the kind of communist countries collapsed, you had kind of reform movements, glasnost and perestroika and so market socialism, this, the debates on optimism. In these countries, I mean, there was a lot of fluidity and experimentation on all fronts. And I think that then got um, uh, channeled. You had Thatcher and Reagan revolutionizing <laughs> advanced countries. And then you had, it, 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 was, it was very tumultuous. And I found my voice and position and, and kind of, um, um, in that in that in that condition, I I, I realized where the, where the progress would move towards. This was in the early 90s. Let's say five years of this, there was a whole convergence within the in the field um, uh, where we where we where we thought what this pursuit of continuities and complexities with digital media, and already there's a hint that this could positively correlate with a neoliberal project. And that was also Greg Lynn's opinion, um, although he never politicized as much. That was that something then we kind of discovered and worked through. And maybe there's another moment of crisis and, and resetting of, of, of uh, parameters coming, coming up soon. But that's the way I discovered some of my, let's say, hidden hidden skills and hidden um, priors came to fruition in this condition. And the other thing, which is also quite surprising um, because I was, uh, I, when I was in my philosophy studies, I was interested in, um, in, in, in logic <laughs> and uh, in uh, computer science and I connected up as well. And I had an early interest in, in, in programming and so on. So that came much, it also was kind of slumbering there, unutilized, and came out uh, uh, much later. So, so, so I would <laughs> encourage everybody in this period, and that's the period where there is uh, no set path, and we have a kind of interesting division of labor, what, what hidden talents and priors and skills and experience you have, which uh, make you a kind of, allow you to make a, a particular contribution. And uh, you can call this identity, that's fine as long as it's not a stereotype and as long as it's not something you, 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 you have to be truthful to, you have to be pragmatically exploitative about. Hello? Did you hear me?
Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. I'm Sorry, I was muted. Okay. Now, do you want to ask? Yeah, I yeah, see. Can. yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for being with us today. Um, I wanted to ask, um, do you think, um, wait, I lost my question right now. Um, do you think that um, the par parametricism style is a vernacular in a sort of way and how like it reacts to the environment or is it not vernacular at all? So that's basically well, I don't think, well, vernacular, it's, I don't think it's vernacular because it's a global paradigm and global set of principles, but it is locally, it has this, the prior, a priori of local adaptiveness. And that's different from modernism. Modernism was the first international style, a global style, which has little capacity to be locally adaptive. It was just kind of mass repetition and spreading a, the solutions around the globe, uninflected, unadapted nearly. Uh, it's not totally true, but, but in terms of paradigm, there is a spirit of local adaptiveness, which of course was with respect to the particulars of site, the complexity of site is because it's never green field. You know, it's able to deal with topography with a lot of complex neighboring buildings and sites, and geometries, but also climatically. Um, we should be, we believe in passive systems, so we don't believe that there's a one fit all kind of envelope and then pumping energy, uh, but to be learning from the local culture. So that makes it locally adaptive. And that's the learning from the vernaculars is for me a research project was very similar to biomimetic research because the, a lot of these uh, vernacular traditions have had a long time try and error evolution, not scientifically invented, but evolved let's say, sensible usage of local materials of making, allowing for comfort uh, uh, without using energy because there wasn't energy pumping and air conditioning. So that's another element in which it's, uh, it could learn from the vernaculars. Of course, it has to adapt that and, and retrieve that and make that a science, similar to the way biomimetics takes evolved models from nature and picks up ideas and then kind of readapts it to, to, to modern conditions. So that's what I'm saying. But the vernacular itself, yeah, it has shared some similarities because what you had in the vernacular as well is because you had you had this kind of local adaptiveness of the structure to, to a sloping side, to, to existing neighbors. Uh, but it was also at the same time obviously uh, quite constricted in its means. And, and, and to just continue a vernacular uh, is, is not ideal. And also the philosophy of vernacular is antithetical uh, in architecture in the way that the vernacular is what I call tradition bound building. You do what has always been done. It's very much based on stereotypes. I mean, since there have been evolved stereotypes, there's a kind of evolutionary learning in there like an organism reproduces now it's a good idea that there's 99 percent reproduction only one percent mutation uh, the same would apply to vernacular if and to the extent to which the conditions of success are still the same yes climate might be still the same but many other aspects are, are not so so i'm not a kind of in favor of of vernaculars uh, verbatim but i i think we can learn from the vernaculars and I think that we have that, the spirit of local adaptiveness. Um, but the, the, the outcome could be quite surprising. Doesn't have to look like the existing vernacular. And doesn't have to, I'm not into, uh, I don't think it's a good idea to give, let's say, uh, audiences this mood of um, localism um, and this mood of kind of, stability it's been as it always was and uh, and this kind of uh, very kind of conservative spirit um, I, I think is, is not something I'm into but at the same time even in the political domain I like some aspects of conservatism where they warn us that you can't kind of uh, uh, there's a kind of a hubris of thinking that evolved ways of living and living together and social institutions which nobody invented which are tradition bound in this sense that they are therefore irrational and need to be uprooted and that you could uh, substitute that with, an, with a kind of uh, uh, invented formula which probably if it's not been tested 
is 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 has a huge risk of 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 destroying more than it fixes. So 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 that's a number of things I'm, I've been saying. So with a kind of even as, as with a radical innovator, I do believe um, that the that the traditions of this world on many levels, even on the social level, to the extent that some aspects of social life are still similar, can be um, uh, maintained, transformed, retained. So I'm not this kind of root and branch tabula rasa modernist, uh, which is the kind of spirit of enlightenment. And to some extent, I have some time for a person like Christopher Alexander and his pattern language discourse, I think, but not lock, stock and barrel. It, there's a real risk of conservatism there as well. Okay. I want to maybe end this discussion by saying something about next week, Patrick. We'll have like a, okay. um, we'll have a, I'm sorry because it's Shabbat and I need to respect the students that uh, that's what I, we, uh -huh. okay. Um, so we were, um, uh, we'll have a guest uh, lecturer, um, Dr. Erez Golani Solomon, which would talk about Japan, and you mentioned that. And maybe if you could kind of give us an introduction for next week um, to talk about the stadium and the, uh, maybe also per, um, the proposal to to have the Olympics next year and etc. Well, the stadium was the biggest set of frustration we ever had, and Ozaha, the biggest kind of let down and, and, and setback and we felt very much uh, sad and mistreated thought it was a fantastic design it actually also comes out of a series of researches we started at the AA and in the office it's a combination of a shell and a tensile structure so it's a highly optimized um, um, structure and also has a nice combination as a set of of anticlastic tensile elements and synclastic shell elements and and uh, so it was very sophisticated and beautiful and had a lot of interesting features of, of inhabiting the structure and it was a well-deserved win. And uh, I congratulate um, Tadao Andro as the head of the jury that he actually allowed us to win and not pick one of the Japanese competitors. So, so uh, and the experience then of pursuing this was very disheartening on many levels. Uh, first of all, the hostility from the Japanese architects, uh, old guys like Maki, but also frustratingly followed up by people like Ito and others who uh, uh, criticized things which they shouldn't have criticized from the selection of a site, which was a prior decision uh, with, where these guys themselves participated in competition on that site and later wanted to, <laughs> to take that out. They, they, they put enormous pressure on our, our scheme and they wanted us to suppress the the arc downwards which made it much more heavy and expensive mm -hmm. and it uh, wouldn't have made any difference in terms of the presence of the building in that park uh, and then the whole let's say um culture of communication in uh, japan wasn't very conducive so we had been aware of budget issues and uh, for instance that arc which had to become more, much more expensive because they wanted to suppress it downwards they also had a cr nearly an insane ideas of cooling every single seat in that stadium uh, only for this kind of olympic and it's not so super hot in japan which is sort of this kind of pride they also wanted to keep all the uh, number of seats uh, which they had once mentioned but it was not requirement from the olympics and they, we, we warned them about all these aspects and made all the way through cost-saving uh, proposals, but they were unwilling to communicate and we realized that Japan is still incredibly hierarchical, kind of old men with, with dyed hair, like the old Chinese communist <laughs> politburo, that's, it's, it, there's a version of that uh, in Japan, right? So that makes it very kind of that culture of hierarchy and and, and uh, the, the way things are political is very kind of uh, dysfunctional when it comes to making proper agile and adaptive decision day to day to keep the project, uh, uh, for instance, in budget and solve problems. It was not a problem solving attitude. And in the end, uh, when, these, when they kind of, you, you're never allowed to say anything, they were never, the, the, the other local architect didn't want to challenge the client, the client wasn't want to, uh, 
move, move one millimeter from their prior decisions, then the, so, so within that kind of thing, you can really see it going wrong. Then the government stepped in and wanted to force the, the, the contractors to just swallow the, the costs and take a big loss. And that didn't happen. So they kind of run into this. So it's a kind of thing where you kind of rigid and hierarchical and you insist until the whole thing is it becomes this brittle and bursts apart. And then we were the victims of that. And in the end, they took all our design of the ball and the interior on it. I don't think it's any single cent cheaper than what we had done. They wasted time. So it was a big frustration. And primarily what I'm saying is the culture of communication uh, was just not um, modernized uh, in the way it would be, for instance, in the US, where it's most kind of agile and, 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 and probably in Israel as well, very kind of agile and open and frank and, and across hierarchies and information flows freely to some extent. We need that. And that if you're going to do something very complex and innovative in time pressure, if you don't have a proper culture of communication, you're going to fuck it up. And that's what they did. So, so I don't know if that's, and my, suddenly it, 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 I realized, my God, that's why they're in such a mess. I mean, they were the greatest catch-up developers, like China now, uh, all the, through the you know, uh, post-war, to reach a certain point. And then they hit crisis point, and everything was frozen up. And since 1990, this is, now, this is now 30 years of stagnation and worse. For the last 20 years, they have negative productivity loss. I suddenly realized, it, that's why. That all makes sense. So I don't know. It, it's, it's a tragedy. And there's some great architects, by the way. Even Ito was a kind of prick. I love his architecture. <laughs> and Sejima and so on. So there's some great figures still within that. And they are kind of, uh, I don't know, they must be kind of um, suffering a lot in that kind of bureaucratic, um, uh, with the concrete hat luck country. On that note. <laughs> Patrick, thank you very much. Um, we highly appreciate it. And we've all learned so much from you. And, and we, it, it well, was thanks a lot, everybody, uh, for the uh, opportunity, giving me a platform and asking interesting questions. So enjoy and bring me back next year. Thank you. Sure in will. person. I'll come in person, okay? Really? Patrick, it's recorded. <laughs> of course, of course. I've been to Israel before and I enjoyed it very much. Okay. I love the place. Tel Aviv in particular. I don't know which city you are in. But... Yes, uh, I think we're basically Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, um, but oh, some went yeah. home to their families since uh, okay. we're, we've been in quarantine for the past month or so. so. All right. Okay. Bye now then. Bye, Patrick. Bye, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Bye.